The thing that fills civilized man with horror and loathing of the barbarian is the feeling of is the feeling of being here face to face with a creature incalculable, man devoid of law. Heedlessly, unthinkably, the savage keeps his oath, and and will as heedlessly. Let's see, so we're on page four of introduction. Heedlessly break oaths and promises. He can be brave and generous in his unruly fashion, and in the same unruly fashion, brutal and bestial. Any act of cruelty, any breach of faith, is far more repulsive when it stands without relation to anything else than when it appears as the infringement of an accepted moral law, a lapse from grace. The barbarian has no character. That is the essence of the Roman verdict. When a civilized man does wrong, he does so at worst because it is wrong. And this, vil and this the villain's consciousness of being wicked marks him as a human being with whom one can associate. But to receive a barbarian among one's circle of acquaintances, or one's circle of acquaintance, is equivalent to building one's house in the immediate vicinity of a volcano. What if the barbarians do build some sort of houses and till the soil? Heaven knows their agriculture is but primitive at best. The way they scratch at the surface of the earth and raise a miserable crop, only to seek fresh fields the following year? What if they do keep cattle and make war and dispense some kind of justice among themselves? Or grant them even some degree of skill in forging weapons. They are not a civilized people for all that. So I think what Wilhelm is trying to say right here is, Hello, Romans. Hello, Greeks. They do everything that you do. What are you talking about? They're not civilized. So something, obviously something, is holding the Romans back from saying that, these barbaric people are civilized. They refuse to admit it. It was about the beginning of our era that the Germanic people first appeared in history. A thousand years later, the world saw the last glimpse of them. For a short period, the Northmen... Now, this is interesting. So, Wilhelm is interchangeably using... Germani, Germanic people, Northmen, and Teutons. It's interesting. Now, I may be incorrect about this, but to me, that tells me that this Germanic tribe, Northmen, Germanic people, Germani, they're all in a big group. Regardless of what we call them, they're, they're similar people, or the same people. Hold the scene of Europe, working out their racial character and ideals with feverish haste, before they are transformed and merged in the mass of European civilization. Their going marks the disappearance of the Germanic culture as an independent type. The Northmen, too, have been portrayed by strangers from without, and the picture has marked points of similarity to that left by their interior kinsmen in the records of the Roman historians. Wild, bloodthirsty, little amenable to human reason or to human reasoning, gifted with splendid vices, and for the rest, devils. Thus runs the character given them by medieval chroniclers. The civilized men who now judge them were Christians who saw the world, not as divided in degrees of culture, but as divided between the powers of light and darkness. Once the incalculable calculable must necessarily be ascribed to some origin in the infernal regions, the barbarians of classical times answer to the demons of medieval Christianity. <coughs> so now he's bringing Christians into it. He's basically saying, Wilhelm, the writer of the book, is saying that the Christians aren't viewing people in culture. Right? They aren't viewing people in country. They aren't viewing enemies like that. What the Christians are doing at this point in time is viewing people as good or evil. Or, you agree with me or you don't. Right? If you don't agree with me, you're evil. 
If you don't do what we do, you're evil. If you do what we do, or if you want to try and do what we do, and you agree with me, you're good. Light, darkness. So on and so forth. This time, however, the picture does not stand alone. Without a foil, here in the north, a people of Germanic race have set up their own monument to later times, showing themselves as they wish to be seen in history, revealing themselves not with any thought of being seen by strangers, but yet urged by an impulse towards self-revelation. <coughs> in externals, the Northmen seem to have something of the same elemental, unreflecting violence, the same uneasy restlessness that led the cultured world to stamp their southern kinsmen as barbarians, reckless and impulsive, not to say not to say obstinate in their self-assertion, acting on the spur of the moment, shifting from one plan to another. The cool political mind might find considerable, considerable resemblance between the Germanic brigands and the pirates of the north. Interesting that he says pirates, pirates of the north. Let's keep that in mind. Hopefully I can remember that. Pirates of the north. I like that. But our more intim intimate knowledge enables us to discern the presence of a controlling and uniting will beneath the restless exterior. What at the first glance appears but aimless flickering shows on closer inspection as a steadier light. In reality, these Vikings... Okay... Here we go. This this is where I wanted to... So now, they're Vikings, right? And Pirates of the North. Interesting how those are in, interchangeable. In reality, these Vikings have but little of that aimless... Eh, sorry, guys. In reality, these Vikings have but little of that aimlessness which can be, page 5 of introduction, characterized as natural. There is more of calculating economy in them than of mere spendthrift force. The men are clear in their minds both as to end and means, will and power. While they may seem to be drifting towards, toward no definite goal, they have yet within themselves and aim undeviating as the compass, unaltering however they may turn. So what is he saying? Dilhelm is saying that these people, even though they seem like they don't have a goal, they do. Okay. The old idea of the Vikings as sweeping like a storm across the lands they touched, destroying the wealth they found, and leaving themselves as poor as ever, has in our time had to give way to a breathless wonder at their craving for enrichment. The gold they found has disappeared, but we have learned now that there was gathered together in the north a treasury of knowledge and thought, poetry and dreams, that must have been brought home from abroad, despite the fact that such spiritual values are far more difficult to find and steal and carry safely home than precious stones or precious metals. So, Wilhelm is saying that the treasures that the Vikings or this tribe actually have that are more precious than gold. are the culture, the stories, the myths, and the legends. Those are the valuable things that we've lost and that they brought from other worlds and made their own. And by other worlds, I mean wherever they traveled, they were able to get knowledge from those places and bring them to their own and make it their own. The Northmen seem to have been insatiable in the matter of such spiritual treasures. They have even in the present day been accused of having annexed the entire sum of pagan and Christian knowledge possessed by the Middle Ages. And looking at the Norse literature of the Viking Age, we find some difficulty in refuting this charge. Though it may seem too sweeping as it is urged by the... This is... I'm going to butcher this. Buga, Buga and his disciples... Others again ask scornfully 
if we are really expected to believe that our Northmen sat over their lessons like schoolboys in the Irish monasteries, studying classical authors and medieval encyclopedias. This would no doubt be the most natural explanation for their modern minds who suck all their nourishment from book and lectures. But we must probably assume that they gain their learning in some less formal fashion. On the other hand, if they had had not the advantage of a systematic education, it is the more incomprehensible that they should in such a degree have gained access to the art and science of the age. They had not only a passionate craving to convert the elements of foreign culture to their own enrichment, but they had also a mysterious power of stirring up culture and forcing it to yield what lay beneath its surface. Even this thirst for knowledge, however, is not the most surprising thing about them. That they did learn and copy to a great extent is plain to see, but even now we may speculate without result, or hope of any result, upon what, was, what it was they learned and how much they may have added thereto of their own. There exists no magic formula whereby the culture of Viking times as a whole can be resolved into its original component parts. So thoroughly have they refashioned what they took until its thought and spirit are their own. The two sides must throughout be seen together. The Northman has not, the Northman has not only a powerful tendency to extend and enrich his mental sphere, but this craving for expansion is counterpoised by a spiritual self-assertion no less marked that holds him stubbornly faithful to the half-unconscious ideal that constitutes his character. He does not face the world with open arms far from it. He is all suspicion and reserve towards strange gods and ways and values that he feels incongruous with his own self-estimation. All that is alien he holds aloof until he has probed its secret or wrung from it a secret satisfying to himself. All that cannot be dealt with he shuts out and away from him, is hardly aware of it, in fact, but, page 6 of introduction, wherever he can, by adapting himself at first to an alien atmosphere, extract its essence for his own particular use, there he will draw in greedily all he can and let it work, work in him. What is Wilhelm saying right here? What he's saying is, when they go, and they go to faraway lands, and they learn about cultures, and they learn about other things, they stand off, they learn everything, they, you know, I, I imagine them not saying much, not trying to change anything, not trying to do anything about it, they learn what they can from this, and the parts that make sense, the parts that are logical, the parts that work, they use those. He's saying, you, there's no way to go back in Norse culture, in Viking culture, and find out what the original is. These people went all over, and they pulled out the pieces of religion, culture, stories, legends, myths. They pulled those pieces, and they said, this makes sense. We need to use that. We need to adapt to things that make sense, so on and so forth. I'm going to stop there. I'm going to try and do these videos in 10 minute intervals. If you would like me to do more, let me know in the comments. Please rate, comment, and subscribe. We'll talk to you guys later. Have a good one.